Today I'm going to talk about the good and the bad in rare books. Uh, and I guess I got to throw in the ugly. Uh, what I mean by that is when I'm looking to purchase a book or a book has been offered to me, I really have to decide, is this book for me? Uh, despite the word rare in rare books, there are many rare books on the market, I can assure you that. Uh, and there is only so much capital uh, and only so much time, especially as an uh, individual bookseller, that you can put into a single volume. So you have to be very judicious and decide uh, if it's something you really want to purchase. Now, one way I do that is I uh, weigh, like on the scales of book justice, uh, the good uh, aspects of the book versus the bad aspects. Now, I don't mean that in the sense of a negotiation, like when you go to an antique dealer with your prized family possession uh, and he underscores uh, all of the uh, problems with the item at hand, it's where, it's uh, the fact that it's common. Uh, meanwhile, he's calculating in his head uh, all of the uh, good things about it in terms of its desirability, its artistry and leading into profit. So I don't mean that type of negotiation, uh, but it is a sort of self-negotiation that I honestly do in my mind uh, when I'm looking at a book and I'm deciding, is this book for me? So I will give you uh, three examples here. I will go over some of my honest thought processes in terms of the really bad aspects of the book and the really good aspects of the book. Now, obviously I did purchase them, so the good outweighed the bad but you will start to see how I think about things. Uh, this first book uh, is a book printed in the 1820s. Uh, it is a uh, little travel guide to the Isle of Wight. Uh, and it was given to uh, a young girl uh, who received uh, from Queen Victoria a small piece of her dress and fashioned it into a book. Uh, what are the bad uh, aspects of this book? Uh, for one, it's not a visually very appealing volume. It's a sort of a ratty uh, looking volume uh, in poor condition and the cover is starting to detach. Uh, it's quite dull, uh, even if the fabric was once vibrant. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not an important work. It's a very minor travel guide to the period it's also missing some pages to the book. Uh, so that can, of course, make it a very undesirable little volume. But simultaneously, I don't know if it's the left or the right side, uh, I was thinking of the positive aspects of the book. And for one, uh, the, it's a very charming inscription about this young girl, 10 years old, Susan Cork, who was on the Isle of Wight in 1838, and she met Queen Victoria, who must have been truly enamored with her because she cut a piece of her dress, perhaps her summer dress, and gave it to this young little girl. Uh, queen Victoria was a very young queen at that, uh, in 1838. She was on the throne for one year. Uh, the girl then took this uh, cloth and she fashioned it into a book binding. Uh, we tend to call these in the trade vernacular bindings. They've become very popular to study and collect. Uh, they're often made by women or at home and they have a real homespun vintage quality to them, which is very appealing to the modern eye. This is no exception. It's just particularly charming. And the fact that it used a piece of fabric of the queen uh, makes it all the more interesting and fun. Uh, then the, the, the inscription goes on that uh, later in that year, she emigrated to America uh, and brought the book with her. And I could just imagine in my mind this 10-year-old girl having met Queen Victoria and being given a small token of her affection. It must have been an extraordinarily treasured possession because you could not bring uh, too much on uh, the boat uh, when you were emigrating, but she must have truly loved this book. It descended in the family, uh, and it has such a marvelous quality as an object and charm to it uh, that uh, those good qualities far outweighed uh, the bad. 
book number two. Uh, these are the uh, meditations or the soliloquies of Saint Augustine. Uh, it was a book printed in 1577 in London by John Day, a well-known Elizabethan printer. Uh, when I first looked at this volume, again, it is in a uh, rather decrepit condition here. Uh, the text block is breaking, the binding is falling apart. It looks as if a, a, a rat chewed <laughs> uh, to the bottom of the spine here. It's also sadly incomplete. Uh, and uh, I can tell you from experience, the neurons in my brain keep firing. Don't buy incomplete books. Don't buy incomplete books. I have always had a hard time selling them, even if I appreciate them. So uh, those are the bad aspects of the book. Uh, simultaneously, I was thinking about the meaning of some of the uh, soliloquies of St. Augustine, which were very received a very popular reception uh, in uh, Elizabethan England. Uh, they were printed in numerous editions. Uh, but what is particularly interesting about them is they had a profound influence on uh, not only uh, other uh, theological soliloquies and sermons of the period, but even more dear to my heart on uh, dramatic soliloquies, uh, uh, which we uh, perhaps uh, uh, think of uh, in terms of Shakespeare and other great uh, playwrights of the period. So they were a literary form that had a great influence, uh, and I find that uh, very interesting. Uh, the other thing I really like about the book are these extraordinary woodcut borders. Uh, now, uh, Memento Mori are basically reminders of uh, the transience of life, that death is to come. And uh, again, going back to Shakespeare, we think of uh, one of his uh, most uh, famous lines, alas, poor Yorick, uh, holding up the skull. Uh, these borders contain almost innumerable <laughs> memento mori. On every single page, we see a skull at the bottom uh, with a uh, accompanying uh, truth or a little uh, pithy saying. Uh, and uh, to me, that is absolutely remarkable also because they are not identical borders. There are subtle variations in each one. And I just imagine the woodcut artist, I don't even know if he's known or if he's anonymous in the literature, who was commissioned uh, to make so many of these uh, all very slightly uh, different. Um, and for all I know, uh, because this was a popular edition uh, during the period, Shakespeare himself, uh, I can imagine, might have seen it and might have perhaps been influenced by uh, some of these hundreds of uh, skulls when he inserted those famous lines into Hamlet. So clearly, at least for me, uh, the uh, good, again, outweighed the bad uh, for this charming Elizabethan volume. And finally, moving on to the third book here, uh, the Corpus Juris Civilis, a classic book of law, uh, printed in 1663. Uh, the things I do not like about the volume, the bad, when I held it in my hands for the first time, it is large. Now, I happen to admire of, uh, large folios, but as a bookseller, they do take up a lot of space, are hard to move, so they better, at least for their weight, uh, be worth the money. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that I've seen uh, this particular legal text in so many editions uh, throughout Europe. It was frequently reprinted. I've described it so many times uh, that uh, it perhaps seemed a bit of a uh, boring text to me without insulting any of the legal scholars or legal collectors out there. Uh, so it's a volume that I almost did not purchase. 
Uh, but then why is it here? Well, these are the good qualities of the book. For one, it is in its original binding, and it's a very charming, appealing binding of uh, uh, pigskin. Uh, one of the ways I tell pigskin over vellum are the three little follicles there. I learned that from a veterinary pathologist. It uh, has some of its, um, or most of its original uh, metalwork attached. Uh, and uh, it is, despite being a book that I've seen many times, a very important work. The Corpus Juris Civilis, or the Justinian Code, was promulgated by uh, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian. Uh, and it really was a uh, reworking, a revamping of Roman law up until that period. And it had absolute, it had profound influence for centuries to come on the development of legal traditions. Uh, and it really, uh, to this day, underpins as a really foundational work a lot of Western uh, legal tradition. So an extraordinarily important work in the history of law. Uh, in terms of this uh, particular volume, uh, one of the things that I liked about it are the wide margins. I don't know what it is about wide margins like fine wine and perfume. They just uh, really uh, appeal to uh, booksellers and book collectors. Oftentimes the books are cropped down right into the text. So this is a nice large paper copy of the book. And then finally, generally I have an appreciation, of course, for the workmanship and the time involved in producing uh, books on the hand press. Uh, from creating uh, the type font to using the press itself. This is a particularly interesting example of that because the topography is absolutely tiny. You can imagine how difficult it was to create and set the type for this enormous volume that's uh, running thousands of pages. It's really a monument to the printer's art in the 17th century uh, and the art of the topographer. So uh, I could really appreciate this as a fine example of printing of uh, the period that I then sort of uh, fell in love with. So uh, that is why I purchased this enormous volume and now I just have to find some space for it. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, you will subscribe and I will share some other good, bad, and hopefully interesting things about the rare book business going forward.